It is okay to applaud a performance well done. Thank you, Joel. I don't know about you, but this time of year, the music, I think, is my favorite time of year for music. I love the old Christmas carols. Part of that might be my age, but that's okay. I grew up singing them, and they're, I mean, it's just part, it, it gets me excited. Think about what we celebrate this time of year. The greatest gift, the most wonderful gift we could ever receive. And I hope this morning as we sing that you'll be able to express some of that inner joy, that gratitude to our God and our Savior through what this carols and other songs that we sing. So let's stand this morning. We're going to start with some carols, most of which I think you might be familiar with.
Shall we pray? Lord, as we think of that announcement, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Lord, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be born, to live, and to die so that we might have salvation through his sacrifice. Lord, we, we are sad because of what he had to go through, but we rejoice because we know in the end you raised him from the dead and gave us also hope for eternal life. We pray that you would help us to listen to your word today as we think of the great joy that that has brought to all of us. We pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you all here this morning. It's a blessing to gather and worship together. Amen? Amen. We want to also extend a special welcome to you this morning. If this is your first time here at McCoy, we're thankful that you're worshiping with us this morning. If this is your first time in the pew, it should be a guest card. If you could take that out and fill it out, we want to know you by name be able to greet you by name, and uh, if you could place that in the offering plate, we're going to be taking an offering in just a few moments, that'd be your gift to us, but also in the foyer, if you are a first-time guest, we have a welcome table, we have more ministry information there, a little gift bag for you, please stop by, uh, we'd love to be able to get to know you a little bit better. I have a couple announcements this morning, the first is, you're going to want to come back tonight at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a chili supper together. And then about uh, 10 to 6, we're going to load up and we're going to go out and we're going to Christmas carol. And that is a tremendous blessing to these people who we get to carol to. We, every year we get phone calls thanking us. It is a ministry. And not only is it a ministry to them, it is a blessing and fun to us. And uh, I, it's just a highlight of my year. encourage you to come out. If you can't be at the Chili Supper, be here at 10 to 6 and we'll head out together and enjoy that time as we bless others. Also want to mention this Friday, Christmas Eve, 6 o'clock, right here for our Christmas Eve service. We look forward to seeing you there for that as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship. That's what Christmas is about. Jesus Christ, our salvation given to us. That's all I have for announcements, Pastor. Good morning. Good to see each and every one today. And uh, I have some good news. First of all, two, two pieces of good news. First of all, we have two Marines with us this morning. We have, uh, it's good to have Sam Anderson and Trent Kircher. Gentlemen, stand up. Yeah. Good to have you here. Thanks for your service. Okay. And also, Good news, you know this, regarding Cody and Emily Hall. Um, they, uh, on Thursday, not they, Emily, gave birth, <laughs> gave birth to twin daughters. <laughs> Sophia Grace, five pounds, 12 ounces, and Margot uh, Ann, Margot Ann, four pounds, 15 ounces just one ounce shy of five pounds. So uh, they're both doing well, and I don't know if they're home yet or not. Today, this afternoon, okay, good. So praise the Lord for that. I'd like to ask the men if they would come at this time. We're gonna receive our offer, pardon? Austin's partner is here today too, he's home. Oh, I didn't know, I didn't see him, where are you? Oh, I didn't see him. Austin Springer um, in the Army, U.S. Army, yeah. Sorry, Austin. I did not know you were here. I'm talking to him. You can't see him, but I'm talking to him. Down in the multi-purpose room. Okay, let's pray. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our Father, I want to thank you now that uh, we think of the Apostle Paul's statement, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And we have the privilege as a congregation, 
not only for our missionaries around the world and in the states, but also our, our ministry here, which affects more people in a wonderful, godly, positive way than we have actually here this morning. We're thankful for our ministry. We're thankful for our missionaries. And as we give, may we do so with you at the very center of our priorities. You are first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be given to you as well. May we believe that and show it by our generosity. Bless us now as we give and as we worship as we do that. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them.
time to remember God's faithfulness. Praise, Praise the Lord and rejoice in His goodness. Advent is a time to remember God's blessings. Praise the Lord and rejoice in His goodness. Advent is a time to remember God's promises. Praise the Lord and rejoice in His goodness. Advent is a time to celebrate the end of darkness. Praise, Praise to Jesus, the light of the world. This morning we light four candles. This candle reminds us that Advent is a time to give praise for what God has done, for what God is doing, and for what God will bring to completion. As the light of Advent grows brighter, it reminds us that we move closer to receiving the gift of a Savior, Jesus, the light of the world. to you from a distance, from a world filled with darkness. Help us to seek the light of your truth as we remember your promises and offer our praise for your amazing gifts to us. Amen. You can remain standing. <laughs> we're not done with you yet. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Salvation now unfurled, hope for every nation, not with fanfares from above, not with scenes of glory, but a humble gift of love, Jesus born of man. Sounds 
Father, we are truly grateful from the bottom of our hearts for this wonderful gift of salvation that came through our Lord Jesus. The beginning of his life here on this earth as a baby, not even afforded a cradle, but lying in a feed trough. The first, other than his mother and father, to gaze on him were the animals, his, his creation, and then humans. And as we are here this morning, Father, accept our worship, accept our praise, accept our thanks for that unspeakable gift. It's in our precious Lord's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Christmas is the largest celebration around the world each year. Other holidays get a single day, but Christmas gets an entire month, one, tw one twelfth of every year. And during the Christmas season, billions of people set aside their normal routines to decorate their houses, to send out greeting cards, to buy gifts, to go to Christmas parties, to attend church services, sing Christmas songs, watch Christmas TV specials, and travel long distances to be with their families. Christmas sights and sounds Fill the air. When Christmas comes, you can't miss it. 
It's everywhere. But beneath all the visible sights and sounds of Christmas are some simple yet profound truths that can literally and really transform your life. Transform your life for the better on this earth and for forever in eternity. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to the passage that was read earlier as Jerry read that in two parts, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Now as Jerry read that, and we're not going to repeat the reading this morning, but we're in Luke 2. The Christmas story has everything in it needed for a great story. There's political intrigue. There's conflict. There's anticipation. There's the drama of a delivery room. There's fear. There's doxology. And there is amazement. But there's one thing in particular that impresses me and ought to impress all of us about the Christmas story. It's been mentioned several times already, but it is how simple and unadorned it really is. In fact, what captures my attention is the insignificant element of the Christmas story. The insignificant element of the Christmas story. Now, some might object by saying, insignificant. I'm just defending myself here. Insignificant. How could the birth of the virgin-born Son of God be insignificant? Indeed, for God to become human is no small thing, and it is not. I'm not, I'm not diminishing that in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I'm pointing to it. But the elements and what happened around, what God used for this, is insignificant, which he made very significant. I think of John, the, uh, the apostle, when we think about God becoming man, and that's what Christmas is. It's just not the birth of, of some baby that grew up doing good things for everyone. He just brings hope for the world that maybe if we do good things, we'll make it better. That's not Christmas. No, the Apostle John, Jesus' disciple and his apostle, whom he sent to be the authoritative representative of himself as he returned to heaven. John said in his gospel, in the first chapter, the right at the beginning, he said this, in the beginning, was the Word. The Word is capital W. Who's the Word? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, notice he now, he, personal pronoun, masculine, singular. He was with God in the beginning, the Word was. Through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. The heavens and the earth. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. And the glory, the glory of the one and only, or the only begotten, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one, John says, has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, or no one has ever seen God, but the only begotten Son of God, who is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. He has made him known. That's what took place in that manger. God became man. But here's what I want Here's what I mean by the insignificant element. What we are intended to observe, I believe, in this passage, is I want you to watch, notice, how the only 
Gentile to write a life of Christ, that is, of the 40 biblical authors that the Holy Spirit superintended over to record the word of God, one of them, only one, was a Gentile. And watch how the only Gentile to write a life of Christ shows in the Christmas story how God fills the seeming insignificant with his presence and he turns or makes what might have been mundane into profound mystery. Now, as Jerry read the passage in Luke chapter 2, did you notice, did you notice the insignificant elements in the story? I'd like to point out that there are three of them. First of all, when we think of insignificant things in this story, and that is insignificant places. Insignificant places. The happening places of the world that are mentioned in this text are Rome and Syria. Rome and Syria are mentioned. They are the, they are the places of the world. They're like today, they're like Washington, D.C., Beijing, China, Moscow, Russia, or ever else where the movers and shakers are, where we turn on the news every day, and uh, however we get that, and what we're hearing about all the time. These are the great places of the world. These are where the powerful people are, the people of, that have political clout and power, and through their decisions either bless or make our lives harder than normal. But this is the world, the happening places of the world. And people who, people who ruled others lived there, and these are people that mattered as far as the world is concerned. No one cared much about Palestine in that day. Tucked away in a small park pocket, of the Roman lake or the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, there's Rome right there, and there's Jerusalem or Bethlehem right down here, part of the Syrian area. That's why Quirinius is mentioned, the governor of Syria. Tucked away in the extreme eastern side of the Roman lake or the Mediterranean Sea. And no one really cared about what was taking place there, except God, of course. Except God, of course. But these were insignificant places as far as God was concerned and as far as what God was doing at that moment in this world. And by contrast to Roman Syria, our story sets its, focus on, sets its focus on little places. Little places. Places like Bethlehem. Places like Bethlehem. Granted, from as Christian believers, we think a lot of Bethlehem. Bethlehem's big. Bethlehem is what the prophet Micah prophesied. O thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel's whose origins are from ancient times. We think of that biblical prophecy and how uh, it took place in this story, how, the, how they came to Bethlehem. But the point is this, as far as the world was concerned, as far as the Washingtons, um, DCs, the Chinas, the Beijing, the Moscow, I'm using those as representative of the world and the power centers of this world. This, this place called Bethlehem was nothing. They didn't care about it. it even among the clans of Judah, it was small. Too small to be registered among the clans of Judah. What about like Nazareth? Nazareth. I mean, I, I think of the passage in John chapter 1 where Philip found Jesus to be the Messiah and he was so excited he went to get Nathaniel and he told Nathaniel. 
And he said, listen to, listen to the exact words he says in John chapter 1. I'll just read it. I'm just going to bring out uh, one verse here. Uh, he said, but Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And you know what Nathaniel's response was? Nazareth? You've got to be kidding. Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Little places. Despised places. Insignificant places. What about the manger? Oh, my word. A common cow trough in a barn where the feed was put, a common cow trough, but it's mentioned three times in this passage. Three times the manger is mentioned. And what about the fields where the shepherds were, where the shepherds watched their flocks at night outside of the little town of Bethlehem, out on the fields? Insignificant. The first Christmas took place literally down on the farm. But you know, folks, when God comes near, the little places become big. The little places become really, really important and big. We're talking about what God is doing, the Creator, our Redeemer. These places become really big, and we're intended to notice this. There's something else here, a second insignificant uh, category or element in the story, and that is insignificant people. Insignificant people are in this text. The most important people of the world are mentioned in verses 1 and 2. Caesar Augustus and Quirinius, governor of Syria. They were, as I've said, the movers and shakers when they spoke people listened. Caesar Augustus, 31 B.C. to A.D. 14, for 45 years, he is considered, the, he is the first, and according to many, and I'm talking about ancient and modern historians, he's the first, and according to many, the greatest Roman emperor. He repay, replaced the republic Rome used to be a republic with a senate. It was a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Where do you think our founders got the idea? Rome used to be a republic where representatives of the people were there uh, advocating for them. But under Caesar Augustus, it was changed to an imperial form of government, top-down, an emperor. Also, he expanded, uh, the, he expanded the empire to include the Mediterranean world, all around the Mediterranean Sea. He expanded the empire to do that. He also, under him, he established the Pax Romana, which means the Roman peace, and he ushered in the golden age of Roman literature and architecture. He was a big deal in the world, as far as the world was concerned. What about Quirinius, governor of Syria? Well, this official was possibly in office for two terms, from 6 to 4 BC and from AD 6 to 9. And a census is associated with each of his terms. The, this is the first census, and it says that in the text, verse 2. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. There was another one later on. It's mentioned in Acts 5, 37, or referred to. A census, what was that for? Well, they took a census, was used for military service and taxation. Jews, however, were exempt from the Roman military service. They were exempt. 
But God used the decree of a pagan emperor to fulfill the prophecy of Micah 5.2. Amazing. So the important people of the world are mentioned here. But the point, by contrast, is the Christmas story looks to different key players. Okay? First of all, it looks to... It looks key players like a very young, poor couple from Nazareth. Very young, poor couple from Nazareth that God was involved with at that time to get them to go to Bethlehem. I think of, I just talked on the phone to, uh, this week with David and Bethana Quast, a young family with two children. They, they have gone and they have been serving in Indonesia. We support them fi financially. It's a big, big country with a lot of islands. But they've been there training for this year and they're almost done. They've been there 10 months. They're almost done with their first year and they're learning the language. And within two months or three, they're going to be moving to another island which contains people groups that have never been reached yet. And they're going to go there, and they're going to go, live among them. They're going to learn the language. They're going to put it in writing. They're going to take the scriptures, and that is going to be there. That is going to be how this young couple raises their family. And I'm not being critical of anyone that chooses a different path, but those people are important to God. To the remotest places of the earth, do you think God's in that? He is. Wherever else people might want to do or what they want to be in this world, here's a couple that have heard, sensed the call of God, and have said, here am I, Lord, send me. And that's where they will be career people to do the work of God so that that people group, whatever it is, that people group, can know about the Lord Jesus Christ and about his salvation so that they can be saved. This is a very young couple, a poor couple from the city of Nazareth. What about shepherds? Shepherds, you say, well, shepherds. Biblically, you know, shepherds are important. Biblically, we think of David. David was a shepherd. Remember when Samuel came? And, and uh, Jesse brought out six of his boys. Six. And he went through them all. And not one of them was the, was the one that God wanted to be the king of Israel. So David said, there, is there another one? Oh, yeah, there's another one. But he's out watching the sheep. Bring him. So shepherds become important to us. David. What a great king. And not only that, but we think of Joseph in the Old Testament where uh, he was going to bring his family down to Egypt. After he rose to power, God did that. And he was very concerned that his brothers did not mention that they were shepherds. Because it says in the text, the Egyptians despised shepherds. That's why they gave them by themselves the land of Goshen, which was a blessing. Shepherds. Like, like not only that, well, what about the innkeeper? The, now, the innkeeper. <laughs> In every Christmas play, there's an innkeeper. Someone gets the privilege of dressing up. Do you know the innkeeper is never mentioned in the Bible? That's okay. We know that there was one, but he's never mentioned. This person is so insignificant that technically he's not even mentioned in the text anywhere. It just said there was no room in the inn. Someone had to tell him that. But these are insignificant people. But when God comes near, all the so-called little people suddenly matter in God's plan and purpose for this world. And then there's a, something else insignificant a third element, and that is insignificant events. Insignificant events. And one of those events is taxes. Okay? 
The event that would make news was taxes. It still does make news. Okay? A census was taken to determine military service and taxation. And um, so that was an event. Here's another one. But our story, the Christmas story, focuses on the birth of a baby. Now, that is pretty common all the time in every hospital, all over the place. A birth of, a, of another baby. But this is anything but a normal birth. This was a matter of fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy. Jesus had various credentials to support his claims to be the Messiah of Israel, the Son of God. He had various credentials. And one of them was his miracles. That is why Jesus performed miracles. They were signs. They were signs pointing to who he was. That's why he did them. Whether it was raising the dead or cleansing lepers or whatever. But one credential that is often overlooked, one of the most profound, is the fulfillment of prophecy in his life. Over and over again, Jesus and the gospel writers appealed to the prophecies of the Old Testament to substantiate his claims as the Messiah. In the Old Testament, there are 60 major, direct, major messianic prophecies that, was, that were fulfilled in one person. Now, there are many other, 270 other ramifications that are there in the Old Testament, but 60 major prophecies that point to Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God, as the Messiah. What about the appearance of the star? God put the star there so that the wise men from the distant east could be pointed to the place where this, the Messiah, the Son of God, was to be born. And, you know, there's a lot of articles written about this star that, uh, you know, through astrological charts and so forth, we can figure out whether it was a natural thing. No, God put the star there. What's so hard about that? He created the heavens and the earth. The appearance of that star. What about the virgin conception and birth? The virgin conception and birth. This was anything but a normal birth. And the point is simply this. When God comes near, when God comes near, all the little events become immensely significant. Immensely significant. Now I want to make this all personal. Make this all personal. And here's what I want you to notice or hear. First of all, you are meant, and me, you and me, we are meant to pay attention to these insignificant places, these insignificant people, and these insignificant events. And here's why. Because it is in the insignificant places and people and events of the Christmas story that the wisdom of God is displayed. Now, I'd like to have you turn in your Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'll explain that. But I want to say that again. It is in the insignificant places insignificant people and the events of the Christmas story that the wisdom of God is displayed. I should say the wisdom and the power of God is displayed. Now, I want you to follow in your Bibles. That's why I want you to turn there because this is a powerful passage and uh, you'll see what I mean. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross, the message about the cross and what Jesus did there is foolishness to those who are perishing. They don't appreciate it. They can't understand it. It means nothing. It's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
for it is written, and he quotes from Isaiah 29, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. In other words, when he talks about the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent, he's talking about the powerful of this world. Those in academia, those with degrees behind their names, the one that everyone runs to, the experts, the professionals, the, the, the people of this world that are of the Harvards and the Yales and the whatever, the Georgetown University, whatever. These, these people of this world, God says, look, Here's why the, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it, it, to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For I, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And I will destroy the intelligence of the intelligent. I'm going to frustrate that. And then he gives proof. Where is the wise man in the church? Among God's people, the brilliant, the powerful of this world, where are they? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Where are they? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Answer, yes. Yes. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews, what are they looking for? Jews want signs. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. That's all they were saying. And Greeks, they look for wisdom. They look for degrees. They look for academia. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Notice it says, not many. Doesn't say not any. There are some. But not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, royalty. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And he chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So I, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. It is in the insignificant places people, and events of the Christmas story that the wisdom of God and the power of God are displayed. Here's something else I want to share by making it personal. The suffering, the suffering of Jesus did not begin on the cross. Now let me, let me just say something about this because we, when we talk as a church or as individuals about the suffering of Christ, we think of Passion Week beginning with entering into Jesus after a long ministry. He entered into, you know, Jerusalem, riding on a donkey on Palm Sunday, and that is called Passion Week, the week of his suffering. But I think that's not accurate to speak that way. The suffering of Jesus didn't begin on the cross. It began in his straw bed and continued through to the cross all for our redemption, all for our salvation. I've been using an Advent devotional. I've mentioned this, and I'm sharing some little bits that I've, I've enjoyed so much, and day number 16 was all about suffering. And the author made this statement, Jesus didn't show up for a celebration. He wasn't here for a vacation. 
He came to a world that had been dramatically broken by sin, and his calling was to expose himself to the full range of its brokenness. This is where the details of Christ's birth are important. It means something profoundly important that the cradle of his birth was a feeding trough in a borrowed barn. You are meant to pay attention to the fact that he wasn't in a palace attached to, attended to by servants. It is important to notice that the first smells that entered his infant nostrils weren't oils and perfumes, but animal smells. It's important to notice that. Jesus' suffering wasn't confined to and reserved for the cross or that week before it. It started the moment he was born, Jesus experienced not one moment of ease in his lifetime. Not one moment of ease. You say, wait a second, how do you know that? Well, one way I know it is by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah says, who has believed our message? Who among us has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, who is the arm of the Lord? The Messiah, the Savior that he would send. He is the arm of God extended to save us. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, the Messiah, God's servant, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. Now that's not very powerful, is it? His birth, his growing up, just like out of a dry desert ground, cracked, there's a little shoot that comes up. Is it going to survive or isn't it? That's how he came into this world. He didn't come with power and celebrity and wealth. Nothing like that. He had no beauty. Notice this. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. There was nothing about Jesus that was powerful, attractive, likable, in the sense of his physical appearance. In fact, it says that we sh nothing about him that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And you know, I think of why he did all that. And I think of this, I think of this verse in Hebrews chapter 4 where it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. He was the man of sorrows. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Because Jesus knows and understands what it means to enter into this broken, hurting, suffering world. Devotional author goes on with these words. The manger of his birth is a clue to what he came to do and what every day of his life would be like. The way God chose to rescue sufferers was by becoming a sufferer himself. Every moment of his suffering was done with us in view. Every dark moment of physical, relational, societal, Judicial suffering had a high and holy purpose to it, our salvation. You see, Jesus came to suffer because he came to be our Savior. 
He came to be our Savior. And because he did that, the man of sorrows, because he did that, God can now offer a wonderful gift, the gift of the forgiveness of our sins and the assurance of everlasting life with him. That is an amazing gift. It is one we better not neglect. It is one we better not treat lightly. The cost involved in this, what God the creator did for the world that didn't love him. To his own people, the Jewish people at the time he came. He came to his own, his own received him not. Who among us has believed the message intended for us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? But because he came and because the manger, all these insignificant things, speaks of his life and the fact that he would go to a cross and become our sin bearer, where he would, the sin of you and me and the world would be placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, not his sins. He would die for our sins and make a perfect, perfect sacrifice in payment a blood atonement for our sin. And the proof that it was accepted was he rose again from the dead, defeated it, so that we could participate in his forgiveness of our sin and life, life. We get eternal life when we believe. At that moment, we get the life of God when we're born again. And so the question is this morning, to everyone that's listening, whether you're here or you're in the multi-purpose room or you're on live stream, the question is this morning, have you received God's gift? It doesn't cost you anything. It's a gift. You know what a gift is? The price has been paid. It's offered to you, but you must receive it by faith. By faith. Believing what God has done, sending his son, Christ died for you, rose again, and then depending on him with your trust, believing upon him to actually do what he came to do, to save you. Trust him to do it. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'd like us to bow our head this morning, please. I don't want anyone looking around or please moving. We have time to move afterwards. If we could just have a quiet moment here, I'd just like to say, if there's anyone here listening that the, the Lord is tugging on your heart. You've not made a decision yet for Christ. But my friend, you need to. The gift you must receive by faith. The Bible says whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on him. Ask him to save you. Tell him you believe. And here's some words you can use. You can make a prayer like this. Dear God, I'm coming to you. I'm approaching you. I know I'm a sinner. Go ahead, tell him that. I know I'm a sinner. Nothing I am or do makes me deserving of heaven. I now get it. I see it. I come with nothing. I believe Jesus Christ, the one born in a manger that you sent, died for me on a cross and rose again. I believe that with all my heart. He did it for me. And right now, I'm putting my trust in Jesus Christ as my only way to heaven. Thank you for the gift of life, forgiveness that I have just received. Our Father, thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you for what it represents. There are churches and places all over the world that's heralding this message right now. And I pray that even those that are listening to me, if there's anyone that's not saved, that this morning has been the day that they have placed their trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for these great, profound, amazing truths. We pray this now in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. If any have made that decision this morning, 
I, as pastor, would like to know because I have something very helpful that could help you, and you need the help to take the step forward here and what's next. So please come and let me know. Let's stand again. Close our service and our time together this morning with the song, celebrating Christ as he came.
This morning, Lord Jesus, we come before you. We bow before you. We adore you. And we thank you for everything that you've done for us from the moment of your conception, taking on human flesh, suffering on this earth, limiting yourself to a human body, struggling through the physical challenges of life as we know it, becoming one of us wholly and completely and yet sinless to give us the most wonderful gift, something beyond our imagination, forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life with you. Help us throughout this season, this next week or so, with family and all of the activity that takes place to remember that gift. It's in your precious name we pray. As we finish up this morning, I'm challenging myself and I would challenge each one of you Become excited, thrilled about that gift. I have three grandchildren here from Peru, South America. And every time they're given something, what do they do? Oh, gee, thanks. No, their eyes light up, their face beams, they jump up and down, they get excited because of a gift. The gift of Jesus, the salvation that he brought, far overshadows anything I could give them for Christmas. So I would challenge you this week, next weekend with family, it, it's okay to get excited, to let it show, to let your eyes light up and your face beam because of this wonderful unspeakable, indescribable gift that God has given us. Now, pastor said I should close. I've got time yet, right? You no. Close, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> no. The clock classes. We still have Sunday school classes ahead of us yet, so enjoy this next period of fellowship and Sunday school to follow. Merry Christmas.